our first scripture lesson today. We're going to be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Now, as I mentioned last week, I don't often get the opportunity to look at a passage in depth. And so for three weeks, we're going to be looking at the last two chapters of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And this is an important letter because it's the very first letter we have from the Apostle Paul. It was written about 50 CE, so about 20 years after the death of Jesus. And it's a letter addressing many of the questions that were facing the young Christian church. So I want you to follow along with me. The passage is printed there in the bulletin, and it should be uh, online as well. A passage that begins in verse 13. Here's verses 13 and 14. Paul says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. All right, pause. The people of Thessalonica were dealing with two different conflicting emotions right then. On one hand, they were expecting the imminent return of Jesus Christ, and yet some in their fellowship had died. And so their concern was, had those who had died, were the departed ones, no longer able to benefit from Christ's return? Had they somehow missed their opportunity? So Paul, in writing to them, is writing to assure them that God's plans for the future include both those who have died and those who are alive. Now the next part, verses 15 to 18. Paul writes, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right, pause again. Paul, Paul is a Pharisaic Jew. What that means is Paul studied the law his whole life, memorizing the books of the Jewish scripture, in particular That meant he memorized and learned the books of what we would call apocalyptic writings. Now these are special books in the Jewish tradition that speculate and talk about a time when God's kingdom will come on earth. It's found in the book of Daniel and some apocryphal books, Esdras and Enoch. So what Paul is doing is using the language he possessed to describe a time when God will inaugurate God's realm on earth. So he's not just talking about heaven here. What he's doing is using an analogy more similar to when the emperor of Rome would visit some of the cities. And when the emperor would draw near, the heralds would blow the trumpets, and the people would come out of the woodworks and the villages and line the roads to meet them, and they would come together in a spot outside the cities. And so that's why Paul is using this language here. He talks about a place where heaven and earth come together. And so in their understanding of the universe, that must be some space in the air between a heavenly realm and an earthly realm. But the coming together is basically an image of the two becoming now one. And actually the descent of Christ is meant to happen on earth itself. But don't forget his whole point in the matter is that both the dead and the living will take part in this coming together. So Paul is not describing an escape hatch to heaven. He's not describing a rapture, which is a word that never appears in the Bible. He's describing a homecoming, a coming together in God's time. And that leads to the last verses. Now concerning the times and seasons, as in when all this is going to happen, Brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. All right, there he's being polite. He's basically saying, don't ask silly questions. 
He then goes on to say, you yourselves know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, will come unexpected, surprising, dramatic. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, just as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there's no escape. But you, beloved, you are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. All right, Paul was writing kind of fast here, and he mixed his metaphors a little bit. He talks first about thieves coming in the night, and then he talks about pregnant women. Thieves, by definition, disrupt the lives of those who think everything is going great that everything is secure and safe. So Paul doesn't want us to become complacent. So he's saying, if you become complacent and forget to look after the Lord, you will be surprised when God's realm unfolds. But then he shifts to talk about labor pains. Labor pains also can come on suddenly, so I've heard. Um, so, but they're not unexpected. And so in the same way, Paul transitions from that to words of comfort saying, don't forget, you are doing what's right. You're doing what's good already. You won't be caught unprepared because I've seen you trust in the Lord all your days. You are of light and of faithfulness, not of deceit or sin and shadows. So don't worry about when Christ is coming. Rejoice that his grace is with you now and always. These then are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Draw close to us once more, loving God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So imagine sitting on the front porch or the front stoop of where you live. And you open your Bible to begin reading this passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 13. As soon as you get a few verses into the passage, you look up and you will probably notice there are dozens of people standing around you trying to get your attention and trying to explain to you precisely what these verses are all about. There's the worship leaders from the mega church down the street with skinny jeans and tousled yet carefully moosed hair, wanting to invite you to their auditorium space to join the hundreds there praising God, lifting their hands to the heavens from whence Christ will soon return. Nearby, there's a seminary professor with copious lecture notes inviting you to her seminar room with tiered seats and retractable desktops where she can fill you in on the nature of Jewish apocalyptic texts, where Paul's language was shaped about archangels and trumpets and the day of the Lord. Nearby, there's a cable TV preacher with whitened teeth and comfy chairs, admonishing you not to cry at funeral services, because the only faithful response, according to him, is to rejoice that our loved ones are now with Christ. And nearby, there's a nervous neighbor, anxious to show you the latest Facebook and blog posts about how to interpret the signs of the approaching end times, since the rapture written about it in so many books must surely be upon us. I can speak from experience because all these people immediately appeared outside my study door when I turned on my computer to write this sermon. Now... I decided not to engage in conversation with uninvited guests. I did let my dog into the study because she always likes to sit at the desk hoping I'll take her for a walk eventually. But otherwise, I shut my door. And I pictured a different setting for Paul's words. And I invite you to do the same. Imagine sitting in someone's home, the home of a good friend, in a comfortable living room, you know each other well, and so you're comfortable if there are moments of silence as you sip tea or coffee together, as you glance at the trees and the sky outside the window, as you see the family pictures on the wall. One of you, 
or maybe both of you have lost someone that you loved. The grief that you feel, though, isn't a fresh, open wound, but it is a real presence in your life and in the room that day. And so rather than avoiding that subject altogether, you choose to seek words of faith that can guide you on this topic of grief. And so the very first words that you read, the first phrases that break the silence, are words of quiet assurance from Paul. We do not want you to be uninformed, my friends, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. In a quiet, caring manner, what Paul does is he begins by offering to first fill in a gap in knowledge. We don't want you to be uninformed. But then next, he gives you permission to grieve. But he mentions something else alongside that grief from the very beginning. He mentions hope. And this hope is not just a concept, some abstract idea. It's a person, Jesus, the Christ, who died and who rose again and who will bring together around him all those who have died. As I mentioned, Paul uses the language from his own faith tradition to try and capture the boldness and the certainty of this event. And so he talks about trumpets. He talks about a coming together of the dead and the living, this convergence around Christ in that mystical space where heaven and earth come together. But he pulls the whole concept around one main point. Paul says, we will all be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. And so we let those words sink in. We take another sip of our drink. We're grateful that the intruders on the front porch are no longer beside us. And then in that moment, the same comfort that Paul offered to the church in Thessalonica is what Paul is offering to us today. As I said, back then, some members of the Thessalonica church had died, but Christ had not yet returned. So the question was, had those loved ones done something wrong? Would they miss out on the promises of a new heaven and a new earth? And that fear was making their grieving process worse. So what Paul does is he answers that question right away. No, they've done nothing wrong. They haven't missed their chance. Death will remain a reality in this world, but death is not the only reality, nor the strongest reality. There is also hope, a heavenly love that is stronger than death. So in Paul's writings, grief and hope are connected in this written conversation and in his whole theology. And that's okay. Many of you are familiar with the work of the medical professional Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Kubler-Ross is credited with chasing away a lot of the taboos that had existed around talking about death and dying. When she was teaching at a medical school, she was frustrated that the student doctors were never given instruction about the nature of the end of life, about death itself. One day in 1962, she was asked to fill in for a very popular professor for a class to introductory students. And so when she went in to teach the class, the class was actually rude to her. They were talking amongst themselves and not paying attention to this short Swiss woman with a German accent. But the room grew quiet when Kubler-Ross brought into the space a 16-year-old girl who was dying of leukemia. And Kubler-Ross turned to the students, these doctors in training, and said, you interview her. You ask her questions about what she's feeling. And so they nervously asked her about blood counts and how well she was tolerating some of the chemotherapy treatments. And eventually the teenager, frustrated, 
exploded in anger and began to ask them her own questions. What do you think it is like to not be able to dream about going to prom or going on a date or growing up? Why don't doctors tell us the truth? When the class ended, many of the students were literally moved to tears. And in that moment, Kubler-Ross said to them, now, now you're acting like human beings and not just scientists. See, all the verses that Paul is sharing come out of this sincere desire to connect with human beings, people grieving, and yet people who possess a deep hope. So, when he offers these verses about trumpets blown on the last days, that seems to get everyone's attention. As we know, there have been many books written about the end times and people that will be left behind while driverless cars crash in some hypothetical rapture. That's all been very profitable in the American church. But it's a flawed American creation. And it's not at all what Paul is focusing on in these verses. Because even when the Thessalonians tried to push Paul to say more about the coming of Christ and to tell them when it was supposed to happen, Paul immediately backpedals and deflects it by saying, concerning these times and seasons, you don't need an answer. You know it cannot be predicted. It will come unexpectedly. Now, as I mentioned earlier, he uses the phrase, a thief in the night which is perhaps not the best image because thieves are not welcome guests. But he's trying to impress on the Thessalonians the importance of what this day means. It is something that is grounded in God's will and in God's love. It's not a continuation of just the way things are, but it's a transformation into what things should be. It's a healing, a correcting of all that's unjust or broken or unfaithful in our life together. And as soon as Paul says all that, he takes another breath, and he offers words of hope. He says, you, my beloved friends, you already walk in the ways of life and light. You seek what is good and true and just. So the day won't surprise you like a thief. When it comes, it is simply the dawn after a time of darkness. Encourage one another with these words. Paul is not offering some superficial truth here. This is not something that would ignore a 16-year-old with leukemia who is angry at cancer's toll on her body. This is not a late-night preacher insisting you ignore the person-shaped hole left in your heart when a loved one, when a miscarried child when a deceased spouse is no longer beside you. Paul wants to enfold the reality of grief and takes it seriously by then wrapping it within a deeper reality of hope. In the words of the Holocaust survivor, Corey Tin Boom, the worst can happen, but the best remains. As I mentioned last week, Scripture is misused when verses are pulled out of their context and then they're used as a foundation for something entirely new, perhaps a theology of racism or sexism or homophobia, perhaps a theology of nationalism and exceptionalism and fear of the immigrant. But if we take the Bible as a whole, as we're intended to, it's a wonderful, complex, honest, yet hopeful message that's given to us. It's a story about God being constantly on the move and persistently working on our behalf. There's the creation of the universe and the beginning of time and the unfolding of human life. But there are also periods of extinctions and Noah and the flood, all serious threats to life, and yet somehow life persisted. There's the creation of a people to be in relationship with God, this confederation of Jewish tribes that come together guided by Torah and the Ten Commandments, who were almost wiped out by war and enemy exile, and yet still they persisted, returning home, rebuilding a temple, 
preserving their faith and passing it on. And God continued to be on the move, coming to us in a child, an incarnation intentionally at the margins of life. The child grew to teach and to heal and contained the fullness of God's being, yet was one with all of us. And that story also could have ended tragically. It appeared to end with an act of capital punishment on a cross. But it persisted. It persisted on an Easter morning resurrection, a Pentecost outpouring of the Spirit, the birthing of small churches like the one in Thessalonica that has grown to a global faith and led to us literally being here today, celebrating baptisms, celebrating God, celebrating life. The worst can happen, but the best remains. We are a people who know grief, but we do not grieve without hope. We are a people who have seen darkness and loss, but by Christ's grace we persist as children of the light. And so we too await that movement from a broken, hurting world to Christ's realm of peace and justice and love. We don't worry about the timing or the logistics or the choreography of this. Instead, we walk today by faith. No matter what tomorrow may bring. So in closing, the poet Mary Oliver wrote this. I want to see Jesus maybe in the clouds or on the shore, just walking, beautiful man and clearly someone else besides. On the hard days, I ask myself if I ever will. But also there are times my body whispers to me that I have. And the poet and apostle Paul we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have died or what is to come so that you may not grieve as one without hope. We will be with the Lord forever. You are all children of the light and the day. Encourage one another with these words. Thanks be to God. Amen.